Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the show. The Atheist Experience is live November 30th, 2003. I'm your host, Martin Wagner, Ashley Perrion, my co host, as always. Uh, this show is sponsored by Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. ACA has weekly meetings every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. at Hot Jumbo Bagels, located downtown at 307 West 5th Street between Guadalupe and Lavaca, except for the first Sunday of each month when we have our lecture series at the Austin History Center in the Mayor's Room, and that is downtown at 9th and Guadalupe. Uh, our next lecture will be next Sunday, and our speaker is Dr. Robert Solomon. And uh, what's, what's he talking to us about? Do we remember? Uh, I believe it's spirituality and atheism. Oh, huh, okay. Say. All right. Well, then that might be what it is. But that's happening next Sunday, Austin History Center, uh, 12.30 p.m., 9th and Guadalupe. And uh, do we have our folks for January and February lined up? Uh, January, no. We're thinking about we might have a business meeting because it's like on the 2nd. Okay. Um, in February, it is Don Baker speaking. Oh, great. Uh, I can't remember the topic, though. Okay. This might be following up on some of his memetic stuff. Or maybe not. No, it's not memetics. Oh. Or at least it's not in the title. All right. But I can't remember what it's about. <laughs> okay. Actually, you have to remember these things. <laughs> Sorry. How do I, I got to rely on you because I don't know any of this stuff. All right. Anyway, well, that's... Oh, Christianity uh, and morals? Christianity and morals. Oh, good one. Or, okay. or I think it's lack of morals. Uh-huh. So. One of those. Either we'll one, the from, same thing. From Don, when, when it happens. But that, okay, so he'll be our February person. But for more information about uh, our lecture series, you can always uh, check our uh, website at the upcoming events page. Uh, other activities that we do uh, on a weekly basis, uh, Godless Gamers, of course, is Monday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. at the home of Russell and Virginia Glasser, and ACA Happy Hour takes place Thursday evenings at around 7.30 p.m. at Antonio's Tex-Mex, near the intersection of Highway 183 and I-35. <clears throat> Speaking of I-35, man, I was driving up here to get to the studio today. Okay. It's just like, oh. Bad traffic? It's well, apparently there was some stupid holiday last week, and everyone oh. went out of town, and they're all, they're, they're all, <laughs> all coming, coming back to town back at the same town. time, right? Oh, so okay. it's just nuts. Yeah. <laughs> it's awful, awful. But uh, it could have been worse, though. I've seen worse traffic. But some idiot had some massive wreck, like right at 11th. Oh, and wow. 35 that you might, might have happened it must have happened between because i got after, here after you i got yeah. here no problems yeah this pickup so. truck all bent up wow so I was like, mm-hmm. okay so uh, non-profits is our bi-weekly internet audio show that plays every other saturday at two o'clock p.m at the atheistnetwork.com website or if you visit our website at atheist-community.org and hit the radio show page there is a direct link to the live feed from that page um I was actually on the radio show last, last week. weekend. Yeah, I, I took or that. weekend before last. Yes, that is correct, Ashley. Thank you. I, well, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, I was. Well, it is the weekend, so about a week ago. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was about a week ago. A week right. and a day. <laughs> right. Yeah, last weekend. Like, okay. <laughs> well, when I took off from the TV show, they, uh, Russell <laughs> called me up, and I did the radio show, and that was fun. <laughs> Um, but the next episode of that will be this coming, coming Saturday, Saturday which sixth. will be just under... Yeah, the 6th. <laughs> yeah, a week from now, minus one day. <laughs> We're so professional here, people. I was there. I was going uh, to my stories here. Uh, anyway, uh, nonprofits. Uh, Jeff D. is the host of that. Uh, Russell Glasser and uh, whoever else is around. And it's 90 minutes of uh, just all sorts of fun arguing back and forth. News analysis. Uh, there is an interactive chat room. Uh, that runs uh, concurrently with the show, so you can uh, interact with the guys on the show in live chat. And and you can listen to about the last half dozen or so uh, past episodes uh, on our website on the radio show page. They are MP3 streams. So uh, be sure to check that out, The Nonprofits with Jeff D. and Russell Glasser. It's tons of fun to listen to. 2 o'clock p.m. every other Saturday, and the next episode will be on the 6th this coming Saturday. And finally, last but not least, I uh, University Atheists and Agnostics, who I'm, I assume are wrapping up their third semester of operation. Yep. Uh, we'll be starting up their fourth semester uh, after the holidays. Um, so for more information about them, uh, you can go to studentorgs.utexas.edu slash UAA and find out more information about University Atheists and Agnostics if you are a registered UT student or faculty member. This is the first uh, really successful uh, Atheist and Agnostic student group at the university, and so we, we give them all encouragement. All right, so that is uh, that does it for the announcements. Uh, this is Atheist Experience. If you've never watched us before, we're here every Sunday at 4.30 p.m. The show's been on the air now for about uh, 
six and a half years. It's a live call-in program. We're here to talk about atheism versus religion. Sort of, uh, we are the one voice of the other side in a predominantly religious society in a, in a cable TV landscape that has six full-time, 24-hour-a-day Christian TV stations. We're the 90 minutes a week alternative. So, um, and so we're proud to to be here. Um, about halfway through the show, or a little less than, we're going to start taking calls. But if you've never watched our show before, and you're curious about it, and you want to, uh, you know, uh, stay tuned and listen to what we all have to talk about, and if you have some questions for atheists, um, have a look at our website at atheist-community.org. We have a fact page, frequently asked questions page, on our website, and that is where we have assembled over the years all the most common questions that athe- that we've gotten on the show, and that atheists in general tend to get from Christians. You know, why don't you believe in God? Well, what do atheists think about this and that? And, you know, what's an agnostic, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's on our website. So if you have a question for us and you've never seen our show before, who knows? Maybe we've already answered your question. It might be on the fact page. But if not, feel free to uh, stay tuned and uh, watch and listen and, and call us up anyway if you have some questions because we are going to have a good show for you today. And uh, I'm happy to be back. Yes. Uh, one last thing also before we go to the news. Uh, don't forget our viewer feedback, uh, t- um, our email address for viewer feedback at uh, tv at atheist-community.org. That is uh, your viewer feedback address. And, uh, wow, <clears throat> the letters just flooded in last week. <laughs> What's up with that? What did you guys do last week? Come on. Uh, last week was mostly uh, um, to talk about In God We Trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arlo was on the show and oh, we went over the money, mm-hmm. uh, having God and trusting on there, the, the history of it, the implications of it, that type of thing. Yeah. And also talked about uh, alternative forms of money, essentially, the, the Liberty Dollar. Um, oh right. That. Uh, but yeah, that's mostly what we talked about. It. Oh okay. Well, I can't wait that. to watch the, the, the so. tip of that one. Um, uh, yeah, because got something like what half a dozen emails yeah. in the viewer uh, email. Uh, th- well, yeah. on a given week, right? There's like you know one or two. Yeah. And then yeah. last week they all poured in. So, <laughs> I guess that's what the show needs is less of me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> when the letters come in. Uh, but sorry, you're stuck with me at least for a little while longer. Uh, so that's it. Letters are at tv at atheistaffingcommunity.org. And um, a bunch of good ones. Uh, I answered several of them. You probably answered some. Okay. The one that I hadn't gotten around to yet was uh, one guy lobbed the anthropic principle at us, Yeah. Um, which is fun. Um, <laughs> and I'll, uh, I'm going to finish uh, you know, my response to that probably in the next day or two. And then sometime next week, I'll make sure and get all the last week's emails up on the viewer mm-hmm. email page on the website yeah. so that everybody yeah. can read them. Um, <clears throat> but some good letters, and we really appreciate it. And we had uh, one letter from uh, a young viewer who was concerned that you know sometimes when uh, you know the, the discussions get a little heated, ah, yes. and um, and that's understandable. You know, we certainly don't want to be out there you know promulgating the yeah. stereotype of the cranky, nasty cranky atheist, the cranky atheist. But you know, I mean, uh, you know, we're not we're not here to, uh, to to pick on folks, and we're not here to uh, you know to be rude and mean. But you know, sometimes you know you get a caller who just. You know, can't do anything else, and and you know, we try we try not to rise to the bait, and we try not to lower ourselves to that level. But uh, you know, sometimes arguments just kind of take on a life of their own. But uh, that caller's concerns are very well, uh, very well taken, and you know, I think most of the time, if you watch the show, you'll yeah. be seen a very lighthearted uh, show. We have a lot yeah. of fun doing this show. We hope you have fun watching it. And it is now time for the news. What's happening okay. in the world? All right, I got some craziness going on this week. <laughs> you don't say. Uh, first off, in Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, the Russian Orthodox Church has expressed its outrage at what it claims is a Mormon scheme to buy up the names of dead Russians in order to baptize dead souls in their faith. In one archive in the town, <laughs> uh, in east of Whoa. Moscow, the Church of Latter-day Saints has paid 10 cents for each page of thousands of names of dead How people. How much is your soul worth? 10 cents to the Mormons. And <laughs> it's, not, it's not 10 cents per soul. Uh. It's 10 cents per page of names. Oh, uh, Ellen, how many? <laughs> so you're worth a fraction of a penny yes. to the Mormons. Um, ma- dating mainly from the late 18th century to be put on microfilm. Uh, the idea, a last-ditch attempt at a cash-strapped archive to fund urgent preservation work, has cure- caused fury among predominantly Orthodox nation. Uh, the Mormon Church is angry at what it sees as an obstruction to its religious practice. It's basically just harvesting names, and uh, it claims that it's not baptizing them. It's claiming that it's going to them post-mortem and saying, look, we have a religion, maybe you'd want to join us. Now, but it's dead. kind of a moot point after somebody's already dead. Yeah, they're dead. How? 
<laughs> it's kind of, um, you know. Any Christian will tell you that these rituals do not harm the soul of the dead, but it hurts the feelings of the believers who, the, who see these rituals with the names of the deceased as equal to the desecration of graves by Satanists. So, I mean, that's, that's at least the, the, <laughs> the, the spirit of rationality in there. We're not actually harming any souls, assuming that there are anything considering souls out there. But it does hurt the people whose names could be on there, you know, relatives and such. But well, still, it's, it's certainly a liberty. Now, what gets me is they're not claiming to, uh, here, our church aims to create a database permitting people to look for their ancestors. Our ceremony is not bapti- rebaptism. It only gives the soul of the deceased person the freedom of choice to accept our belief or reject it. But they're dead. They're dead. But assuming that what they believe is true, that you do have a soul and that it goes on. But to we the don't assume those things here, Ashley. <laughs> well, I know. But again, assuming, let, let's just run with this. Okay. To see where, their their to argument see is. see what kind of wall it hits. Now, okay. assuming all of this, <laughs> there are two choices for the poor Mormon soul who dies. One, they're right. And they're Mormon and they're right. They get their universe and everything's happy. The alternative is they're not Mormon. They die. They see that they made a wrong decision. They see that Mormons were actually the right ones. Now, they already know that they were wrong. They don't need Mormons to come along to their soul after they're dead and say, ha ha, told you so, and give them the freedom to choose. They can already choose. They know the choice. If we, if we die and we find out that Christianity is right, we're going to be down there saying, oh shit. We were wrong. We don't need the Christians then to come back and see our soul and say, I told you so. That's not helping the situation any. <laughs> and giving us the freedom to now believe and get out. But isn't this all just kind of silly? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, mostly. Because I mean, um, <laughs> no- there are no souls. They're just buying reams and reams of paper, a yeah. list of names. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean. And apparently collecting, I don't know. They say that this is the last ditch attempt to, like, you know, do all this work. But I understand why they're doing, you know, paying money to get these list of names. I think these I, people well, aren't going to donate anything. No, but it is. They're it, dead. It is all about wanting to uh, give the appearance that the ranks of the membership has swelled, right? The Catholic Possibly. Church has Possibly. done this all the time, right? Yeah. If you're born into the yeah. Catholic Church, right? You don't get out. Yeah, even if you, uh, you know, grow up and you become a dynamo atheist, yep. and you know, every time you walk past a Catholic Church, you, you know, bare your butt cheeks and give them a finger. <laughs> you know, you're still on their roster of. Yeah members of the faith and that yeah. swells the ranks because they can go right? to the government and say look we have 50 million members now mm-hmm. and so you know if you don't do what we like we'll get all 50 right. million and of them to vote against you so i think that that's really just all the mormons are after but yeah. i just you know i'm tr- tremendously amused by this whole idea of oh we're giving the soul the, the dead person a choice yeah, a choice to to accept our belief or to reject it but they're dead <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a like, little late <laughs> yeah <laughs> And anyway, okay, I, I know that Mormons have a whole different idea about the afterlife than, than mainstream Christians. Yeah. But here's the thing. Either mainstream Christians are right, okay, in which case, okay, assuming that, okay, either they're all wrong, which we think is the case, is the case yeah. but either mainstream Christians are right, in okay. which case, you know, anybody who doesn't belong to mainstream Christianity gets tortured in eternity, yeah, for eternity in hell forever, and, like, you can't get out of that, in which case... You know, it doesn't really matter that, uh, you know, because whatever the Mormons do, if you're stuck in hell, well, then I guess according to the orthodoxy, you're stuck in hell. Yeah. You know, and Satan gets to, you know, poke you with little spears and go hee hee, and you can't get away, right? Uh, but if, um, you know, so if the, if the Mormons are, you know, if, if they're able to do what they claim to do, yeah. right? And then, uh, then this would prove, then if the mainstream Christians are right, then the Mormons, are the ones going to hell, and by because oh. they don't believe in mainstream Christian doctrine, you know about the afterlife, and so <laughs> so what's seem that so what's happening? If, is, even if they're converting them to Mormonism, it's not going to change their position because they're still going to go to hell if the mainstream Christians are right and the Mormons are wrong. Or what's happening is they now have you know these little Mormon messengers, you know some kind uh-huh. of little spiritual guidance that goes up to people who are in heaven, uh-huh. the ones who chose correctly, and the Mormons are wrong. Giving them advice that, hey, we're Mormons, and we have a good idea. Mm-hmm. The person in heaven goes, wow, that's a pretty cool idea. I like Mormons. I'm now a Mormon. Poof, they're now in hell. So by doing this, they're actually sending more people to hell. That's possibly. right. Yeah, what if, yeah, they're what if, possibly sending more people to hell. Yeah. 
That's right. What if the, the, the majority of the lists of people that we're they buy right. the names from, yeah. We're correct. Yeah, we're right. And they're in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> they're now sending them to hell, yeah. possibly. So. Look, I see, the whole, when, you think these, when you think these things through, of course, just the extreme <laughs> silliness of all of it just comes, you know, glaring to the fore, yeah. right? Um, but, you know, uh, it, this, this gets back to some other, um, uh, you know, uh, a similar topic that I've heard discussed many times about, uh, like the whole nation, of, the whole notion of missionaries and what the missionaries would do. Yes. And um, some Christians believe that if you, you know, unless you get the word of God and and you get to profess your faith and and uh, accept Christ and all the rest of it, you are going to hell. But some, there are some sects of Christianity that say, oh, okay, that okay, let's let's take a person like uh, you know. The Bushmen living out in the Kalahari, or yeah. you know, the, the the Stone Age tribesmen living in the Amazon, or yeah. what have you. They've never heard of Christianity, right? And some Christians will say, "Well, no, well, those people are just kind of doomed, all you know, from birth," which yeah. kind of makes their their whole belief system just seem amazingly evil. Yes, you know, uh, because here are a bunch of people who are about to be tortured for eternity without even understanding why. Yeah. Okay. But then you have some Christians who understand that there's a problem with that and say, oh, well, no, those people would, you know... They get a little exception. Though. Yeah, they are, you know, <laughs> God, God would make a provision for them or what have you. Yeah. But here's the thing. What if you have this completely ignorant tribesman, right? And he's, you know, living off and, you know, fishing and, you know, and walking around yeah. naked and having a great time. And he's never heard of Christianity, so he's not real in any real danger, uh, his, any real threat of his immortal soul. And then some missionary tromps in to town, you know, with all of you, know, and, and everyone he doesn't kill with cholera and Western diseases, <laughs> he gets to preach to, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, and the uh, Stone Age tribesman listens to all of this and says, well, I think that's completely stupid. I reject those beliefs. Yeah. yeah. Now he's going to hell. Now he's going to hell, thanks to that missionary. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if the missionary is just left well alone. So if the missionary is just kind of new, yeah. doesn't really have the arguments down all that well, yeah. he's sending more people to hell <laughs> When if they had just then if he had just laid off, yeah. So if the missionaries would just leave well enough alone and and stay home and and not go out and bother people who are having happy lives being <laughs> primitive tribesmen, It'd then be they'd fine. be much better off. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's fun so, to think about all this that is kind of assuming that you have a soul, which right, <laughs> which you don't. Not. So this is all just you know so, amusing yeah. you know chit chat, but <laughs> still, but it's funny. So that's why we we talk about it on TV. <laughs> all right. So uh, what else? But. Last thing, though, that is probably uh, maybe something that, that that's that's something that ought to be a concern to uh, atheists as a thing that you might want to put in your will later on. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody can come along like long after I'm dead and yeah, my, you know, my soul is for me and alone. convert me, so, you know, in yeah. absentia. You know, maybe uh, <laughs> that, could be, that might be a thing that some atheists want to think about. <laughs> now what? Okay. Uh, now we got the scientific news for the week. Ah. Um, this is a small company in London, UK, okay. claims it claims to have developed a technique that overturns sci- scientific dogma and could revolutionize medicine. It says it could turn ordinary blood into cells capable of regenerating damaged or diseased tissue. Uh, let's see. Tristem has been claiming for years that it can take a half liter of anyone's blood, extract the white blood cells, and make them revert to a stem cell-like state within hours. The cells can be turned, then turn into heart cells for mending hearts, nerve cells for restoring brain, and so on. And, and have they done this? Have they? Uh, they have to a certain extent, yes. Okay. Um, the company has now finally provided proof that at least some of its claims might be true. In collaboration with independent researchers in the U.S., the company has used its technique to turn white blood cells into blood-generating stem cells found in bone marrow. Huh. When injected into mice, these cells migrated to the bone marrow and generated nearly all the types of human blood cells. The team will report in January, addition to current medical research, blah, blah, blah. Huh. A peer-reviewed journal. Um, so apparently they have this process that... Uh, the article basically says they stumbled across it. They were not looking for this. Uh-huh. They were looking for something completely different. Uh-huh. Um, but essentially, what they do is they take your blood, take the white cells out of it. They do some, you know, incantations or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is oh, they do to it. Not in- come on, it's, <laughs> not incantations. This is science. Let's not is, confuse the uh, the it uh, is some form new of, age crowd uh, out there any more than there already are. All right. Uh, I, I don't see it exactly yeah. here, but but they do. There's some a procedure of, that there's they some do. Some kind of procedure they do yes. that pretty quickly <laughs> reverts the white blood cells back to stem cell like state. Now they're very careful to say stem cell like. Yeah. See, that's what I want to know. What's the difference between a stem cell like state and a stem cell? Well, it could be one that. It's not com- it's not a complete blank slate. Okay. They may not be able to turn it into nerve cells, for instance. Right. So it's not as versatile 
as actual stem cell research would Potentially. be. Potentially. But it can still do some of the stuff that... Stem cells could. Obviously, the bone marrow thing. Exactly. And this is a way to go ahead and have some treatments that are readily available. Exactly. You know, while they're still trying to hash out, you know, this, exactly. you know the ethical problems. They even that say that with. even if this bone marrow thing is the only thing that they can do with it, that's still really useful and really good. Well, sure. Because yeah. then you don't need bone marrow transplants. Yeah. Or at least in some cases, you may be able to work around it using this kind of therapy. Yeah. But they're so, still, they, they, do they have a lot of research you have to go? I mean, this isn't like it's set in stone yet, is it? Okay. Uh, it's not set in stone. Um, yeah. Tristem is sufficiently confident that its method works to start human trials. Hmm. Uh, earlier in November, it received permission to carry out a clinical trial of its technology for creating stem cells from blood. Uh, senior government research collaborating, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the method will now be used to treat a dozen patients with a, pla- a plastic anemia. A condition in which uh, oh, right. yeah. people have a severe lack of bone marrow. Okay. Uh, he will treat the, the patients with blood stem cells derived from tissue match donors. Huh. And within a week, they should have some kind of results from that. And, uh, within a week? Well, within a week of the process okay. going on. They should be able to tell, is it working or not? Oh, okay. Um, the results should be in by the end of March. Sweet. Okay. So well, hopefully then by the end of the March, we'll know a little bit more. Yeah, so well, that's that's definitely worth keeping an but, eye uh, on. But yeah, that would be really interesting. Like, say, because right now there's obviously lots of controversy about stem cells. Right. How to get them, where to get them, can we yeah, get yeah. them, can we use them, blah, blah, blah. But if we could just take your own, if we could just, you know, take a blood donation from yourself, mm-hmm. get all the white blood cells out of it, turn them into stem cells, and then do whatever you need with them, mm-hmm. there's not as much of an ethical problem about that, mm-hmm. I wouldn't expect. So well, no, there, yeah, there's su- su- significantly less of one. Yeah, so if you're using your own, nice. and also it's a much quicker process. Yeah, and uh, you know, with luck, this can lead to some uh, therapeutic cloning yes. procedures that again don't have the ethical problems that you know people who don't understand anything about biotechnology they hear the word cloning yeah. and all these bad science fiction movies come to mind and they, exactly. And uh, whereas if you can just take somebody's own genetic material. Like somebody who desperately needs a pancreatic or a liver transplant or yeah. a kidney transplant, and just grow them a new uh, organ. Yeah. You know, with their own DNA and they, and, and their own, uh, you know, everything. Yeah. Yeah, everything comes directly from their body, and, exactly. and you're not, you know, harvesting some, you know, exactly. you know, embryo or some of some sort. That could definitely assuage a lot of the fears that you know the anti-science crowd has about these yeah. procedures. Yeah. Yeah, but um, so it'll be very interesting. I'll have to put a note somewhere to try and check up on that again and okay. see what happens in the future. That's the phone number to call us live four seven seven two two eight eight. If you have questions, or comments, uh, just want to chit chat with us. Um, and Ashley's got a little more news. Okay, I think. two more stories. Uh, this one's from India. Okay, uh, an Indian man who claims divine inspiration says he has survived sixty eight years without eating, drinking, or relieving himself baffling doctors who are unable to prove him an imposter. Uh, Clad in his trademark red sari, bangles, and earrings meant to fashion Hindu goddesses, Um, Jani managed to puzzle the Sterling Hospital's 400 doctors. Um, Neurologists say Jani was under watch for 10 days with a closed-circuit camera running, and the doctors were convinced he did not break any of his vows, although there's no way way of verifying whether Johnny Johnny has pulled it off for 68 years. Yeah, that's... uh... Um, His his explanation Uh is when he was eight years old, um, he got some kind of divine inspiration. (laughs) And I get the elixir of life from the hole in my palate, which enables me to go without food and water. So basically there's a little hole between the roof of his mouth and his nostrils. So essentially, you know, you're kind of living on boogers or something. (laughs) Um, uh, some of the doctors said they wanted him to undergo uh, experiments at NASA because obviously if he can do something kind of kind of cool here where he doesn't need food or water that would be really good for astronauts so but well I mean it's quite possible that there could be such a thing as this guy who has whatever weird I mean, he, he has some genetic anomaly some kind of very slow metabolism yeah to where, I mean, yeah, you can go I've for 10 of, days I've heard of people who don't need to sleep like I've heard of are not quite but I've heard of um, yeah you know, people who are get like a, a perfectly sound rest on like forty-five minutes of sleep a night. Yeah. Where you know the average person needs seven or eight hours. I mean, there are these anomalies, but yeah. uh, have they though figured out exactly what it is that's going on yeah. in this guy's body? No, no. Yeah. Like, say they watched him for ten days. He didn't eat or drink or anything like that. Um, but Ooh. exactly what could be happening, they're not really all that sure. Hmm. So, 
Well, we'll see. You so. gotta, well, I'm, I'm, this is in India? Yes. I'm curious to know what the uh, the um, the Rationalists International yeah. organization over there, yeah. if they've checked them out. That's a group of uh, skeptics who... Um, who go around, you know, and expose all these fakers and snake charmers, uh, fakirs, yeah. I think, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, godmen, you know, like they've they've been all over this. this there's this idiot over there, Shri Baba, who claims to be, you know, yes, this divine yes, yes. being, and he's he's essentially just a you know a trickster, as it were. Yeah. But you know, and they've exposed everything he does. Yeah. He still has all his followers, of course, because that's just how people are. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'd be interested to know what Rationalist International. Yeah, what they have to say about this guy if they've had a chance to, you know, investigate him. Yeah, yeah. interesting to know more. Would be he could have some interesting sort of. Uh, it is possible. Yeah, genetic, although I can't think of something less pleasant than that. I mean, I like eating. I know. Yeah, dinner I like is it. kind of fun. Yeah, a yummy meal or something. <laughs> yeah, I can see that there would be benefits to, like not needing all that much sleep. If I could only get an hour of sleep a night, think of all. Oh yeah, I'd you can get that. so much done. I would love that. You get so much done. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I mean. Yeah. Without having to take or, a thirty-year life spent sleeping. Yeah. So. Yeah, being able to. Fly, you know. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be cool. So, yeah. so, but okay. Final story of the day. Um, going back to buckets of wackiness. Uh, <laughs> buckets of wackiness. Um, uh, Bishop Lindsay Irwin of Horsham is urging his clergy to bring buckets of manure into church to remind people that Jesus was born in a stable. Explaining the idea, Irwin said the strong aroma would remind worshippers that Jesus gave his life to clear up the mess people make of their lives. No, it wouldn't. And, he added, (laughs) it might discourage any objections to the use of incense in Christmas services. Now, it almost sounds like what he's trying to do here is say, I like incense, and damn it, you're going to like them too. So, okay, so so people have been complaining about incenses at his services, and so his solution is to bring a bunch of crap into (laughs) church and say, okay, well, how do you like this? Yep. Now, now, how do you like the incense? Uh, <laughs> and he and says, he thinks that this will make people think of Christ's sacrifice or whatever. Apparently, no, it won't. It will make them think this church smells bad. <laughs> it smells. It smells it like smells like crap. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go to a different one. Yeah, I love his quote though. The incense, a symbol of divinity, <laughs> together with the smell of manure, represents the paradox of the in- incarnation. <laughs> Uh, Irwin said a priest suggested the idea during a meeting to discuss ways of bringing the old, old Christmas story to life. Yeah, by so, bringing a bunch by of crap bringing to church. Buckets of crap in church. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I um, certainly think that that man is... Is, is, is full of it. Yeah, you know, definitely, definitely has some paradoxes going on, uh, you know, on a personal level. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know? But, uh, yeah, we'll see how many people continue to go to the church after they're filling it with buckets of crap. Well, so. definitely, you know, some Christmas cheer might be somewhat muted. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> don't drink the eggnog at that church. Boy. <laughs> wow. That's it for the news this week. So Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> on that... Note. <laughs> what can you add to that? There's a phone number to call us live, 477-2288. And uh, TV at atheistypeofcommunity.org, don't forget, is our uh, viewer email address, too, if you want to uh, send us letters and talk to us about stuff. Agnes is on line one, I believe. Hey, you're on the air. Yeah, I got a big relief. I finally called my family that I don't have to go home for this so-called Christmas crap. <laughs> I go up there and worship some man that hung up in his underwear uh. on a cross. <laughs> Boy, are they really mad at me, but I feel relieved. Well, uh, well, good. <laughs> I don't like that. I mean, it, it depends. I would definitely go home for Christmas if I had the chance, because, well, hey, I don't see him, my family a lot often. They <sighs> shove it down my throat, and they don't agree with the lifestyle I live, and me being atheist and all this, and they want to force me going to church, and it's nothing but a big fight, so it's yeah. just best for me to stay home. Yeah, that's a shame yeah. when it does lead to a conflict in the family. Yeah. 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 And I have a question for y'all that's been uh, lingering on my mind about for a month. Sure. Where did the word mar- where does marriage come from or the marriage ceremony? Did it wasn't that created from the Bible? Ah, okay. Well, um I don't know about that well marriage itself as a as a you know, a ceremonial act, you know, man, woman, marrying. Uh you know, that's been around all all through the most ancient of civilizations, you know, yeah. Egypt and before. Um yeah, there are even civilizations that they've found like, you know, again, living out in the rainforest type thing who haven't seen white people before. Mm-hmm. Uh they also have forms of marriage and that type of thing in their kind of society. So it's so it's mm-hmm. not something that is purely, you know, a religious or religious or from Christianity or from the Bible or anything like that. Yeah. Um it's something that's that's 
people as a species do. Yeah, for some reason. Anthropologically, you know, we're, right? We're, we're monogamists. Well, well, or not necessarily that though, but it, it has to do with the fact that being the kind of the, we're a social species. Yeah. You know, we get together in groups and we cooperate, and that's how our species survives. You know, we're not like sharks off all doing our own thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, so, part of that kind of so the kind of social structure that grows in that kind of a society is, um, you know, in the primitive days, you know, when we were all off hunter gatherers, you would have. Um, you know uh, the men as the hunters, the hunters, yeah. and the women were back in the you know in the caves or in the tribes or wherever they were, and the, the women were raising the children, and so it was the job of the men to protect the to protect the women, for one thing, and then protect the children, and uh, from that whole sort of interaction, that whole sort of you know the gender roles that grew out of yeah. that, you know I think you just got this whole idea of men and women bonding, and yeah. uh, raising families, and marriage grew out of that. Um, it's always interesting how, for example, when you hear um, like conservative Christians today um, coming down against like gays and lesbians getting married, yeah. um, and uh, you know their argument is that uh, you know marriage is this religious sacred sacrament, yeah. right? It's this uh, covenant that God has bestowed upon men and women to do what they do, right? Yeah. But what's interesting though is if you know the history of the Christian Church, right? The Catholic Church did not actually formally make marriage a sacrament until something like the 12th century. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I mean, marriage actually, and, and well, to the past marriage, a lot of times, you know, this it wasn't like a love match. It wasn't the way we do marriage yeah. today. These were all, it was all political alliances, family alliances, what yeah. have you. Yeah. And um, this whole idea of marriage as a sacrament didn't really come along. Uh, and you would think that the, if this is something that God and Jesus, you know, wanted men and women to do as some sort of divinely you know, ordained, you know, bond, as it were. Why did it take the church 12 centuries to make it a formal sacrament? Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, there's, but when you understand, like, the anthropology of it all, you know, and how early, you know, homo sapiens and, and you know, just people, early people yeah. developed. I mean, how we developed society, the rise of civilization in the first place. Yeah. You know, and yeah. the, whole, the whole role of, you know, man as hunter, gatherer, protector, you know, woman as, you know, the yeah. you know child bearer and caregiver and what have you then yeah. that's just that's i think that's just where it all stemmed from it just became formalized yeah as other things in our society became formalized yeah you know, you know like having kings and presidents and <laughs> st stuff like that leaders yeah yeah well see that's another thing i was gonna bring my boyfriend up there but y'all's not gonna come up here and check this is the house of the lord y'all's gotta get married <laughs> we're not even talking about that oh are yeah. they afraid they're gonna learn something from me and him if we go upstairs never mind <laughs> <laughs> May, that could be it. Uh-oh. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. That was my question, and uh, thanks a lot. Hey, thank okay. you for thanks calling, Agnes. Take care. Uh. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I, I've, marriage seems to pretty much kind of work out more or less just as well, depending, regardless of what your creed yeah. or your faith map might be. Yeah. In fact, I think in some of the most recent surveys, uh, atheists have a slightly lower divorce rate. Yeah. Christian. Than Christians do. I think the the divorce rate among atheists is something like twenty four percent nationally. Yeah. And I think among Christians it was like twenty six percent. Yeah. The yeah. highest divorce rate was Southern Baptists. I I, I remember that explicitly. <laughs> that was like twenty nine percent. So, uh, um, it just it all seems to uh, you know be a, be a pretty stable, yeah. you know, human institution, you know, regardless of, of yeah. you know where you are and how you live and what you do. Uh, okay. See, so Robbie online too. Hey, you're on the air. Yeah. Um, you're talking about that uh, preacher that wanted to bring the manure into the church, <laughs> right? Yeah, he ought, he ought to read the the armor Krupp because old man Krupp that developed the stainless steel had a house built with no windows in it, so and underneath it he could put piles of manure and had it vented into his, his house because he liked the smell of it. And he ought to be real good and religious. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Yeah, if you read the armor Krupp, it has it in there. Okay. <laughs> wow. Just eccentric people everywhere. I guess. Oh yeah. So I thought, but as soon as you said that, I was like, boy, he really knew Jesus. <laughs> Reminded daily. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if I had to like breathe those fumes day in and day out, yeah. I'd probably have all sorts of. I'd Weird probably see Jesus too, too after yeah. a while. Yeah. I'd, I want to see somebody. I I'd see know. aliens. I'd see you know. I, I'd see just any number of things. <laughs> My goodness. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. Oh, well, thanks a lot, man. Thanks for calling. Take care. <laughs> okay, four seven seven two two eight eight. Give us a jingle. Um, talked a little bit before about polls. 
Uh, I, uh, here's something that I discussed when I was on the uh, Internet Audio Show, the Nonprofits, last weekend. Yes. And um, it's a magazine called The Economist. This, this one's actually about two weeks old. And um, interesting issue. It says, Greatest Danger, Greatest Hope, and it's a special issue on America. And um, this one's you know no longer for sale. And then just, just this week, uh, we have uh, the new Free Inquiry. Ooh, that's glary. There we go. Uh, the new Free Inquiry is here. Um, Terrific magazine. This is uh, published by Council for Secular Humanism. There's a cover story there, Rise of the Nuns. And this has to talk about, uh, this, this has to do with discussing uh, recent poll figures, um, specifically the ARIS survey in 2001, American Religious Identity Survey, Identification Survey, uh, where 14% <clears throat> of the respondents identified themselves as having no religion. Okay. Um, now, the... Uh, the uh, free inquiry article is actually really interesting because, of course, it's like, all right, you know, that some when when that when those poll numbers came in, you know, some people in the atheist communities kind of like got yeah. a little hyper and they were like, wow, you know, there's 28 million atheists in America. Yeah. And when actually, you know, the, the 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 numbers don't really reflect that. I mean, a no religion doesn't specifically mean atheist. you are yeah. you know you are atheist, you are a secular humanist, rationalist, reject all belief in the supernatural, yeah. what have you. Just means that you don't you're you're <laughs> not a practicing religionist of yeah. some form. And in fact, um, it says right here that only actually 40% of the nuns, as they call them, you know, people who said nun when it said, what religion are you? Only 40% of the nuns correspond to the ideal type, more bluntly the stereotype of, you know, the rational secular humanist who does not believe in a personal God, considers the Bible to be a collection of fables, history, and the moral precepts of those who wrote it, and describes her or himself as not religious. So only about 40% of that 14%, okay. um, are really, you know, dying the wool, like atheist, agnostic, secular okay. humanist, what have you. Um, and then it talks about, you know, some of just some of the more curious permutations of this and what it means, you know, and that, um, you know, some people seem to have, you know, weirdly conflicting beliefs, like they don't believe in God, but they believe that the Bible's divinely inspired. Yeah. Which really <laughs> doesn't make sense. Divinely inspired by who? Yeah, then. <laughs> <laughs> but, so that doesn't make a... But... Um, I just got this magazine yesterday, so I, you know, I had, that's the only article in it I haven't had a chance to read yet. But this is a, a terrific magazine that you know I recommend for anybody. Uh, only really good, uh, widely distributed uh, newsstand magazine that's out there um, expressing the atheist point of view. But in the Economist, which is cool, and um, they uh, this is a whole article on Survey of America from like a you know a British uh, you know this it's a British magazine, uh, and they have one and it's all just sort of analyzing you know, kind of America through the rest of the world's eyes and how we're perceived. And there is, uh, a, uh, one of the articles in here is about uh, America's religious persona okay. and how this looks really, really weird, to, especially <laughs> if you're like a secular European. Yeah. Uh, Europe is where they have state religions. You know, they don't have separation of, of church and state in uh, European countries like we have it here, but they are far, far less religious, you know, just person to person yeah. than we are here in America. Um, is it goes on to say, um, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, America looks like two tribes, one religious and one secular. It does go ahead and list the 14% of Americans between 18 and 34 who describe themselves as secular, um, and, and that there is a rise in those numbers, just like there's a rise in people who really consider themselves like devoutly fundamentalist. Yeah. Um, but, uh, goes on to say, uh, this is what's interesting. Uh, American religion is exceptional in two senses. Not only are Americans more religious than Europeans, but they have no national church. Uh, thanks to the separation of church and state, the country has nothing comparable to, say, the Catholic churches of Italy and Spain or the Church of England. Americans are members of sects. Uh, the two kinds of religious exceptionalism are connected. Rather, as in the economic sphere, competing private companies tend to produce wealth and activity. Yes. When you get competition, that exactly. stimulates the economy. Whereas monopoly firms have the opposite effect, stifles the economy, so in the religious sphere, competing sects generate affirmative activity and increased levels of belief, whereas state churches produce indifference. So I know, maybe we, uh, maybe we should lay off the whole separation of church and state thing. We, maybe we should give Roy Moore a break. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah, I can't I, quite, just can't I, do I, it. I think but, as was said, yeah. either on the radio show or somewhere, I can't remember, um, yeah. if, if we did do something like that in 200 years, then yeah, we may it may be great. Right, but for right, right now, but for the next two hundred years, it's really gonna suck. 
<laughs> no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. You know. It's interesting, though. Um, the quality of American belief, what they, they describe American belief as sort of a therapy for the masses, right? Yeah. It says churches come and go with astonishing speed. Um, people tend to kind of find religious sects that already fit preconceived notions that they have, prejudices yeah. that they have, desires that they have, and what have you. Um, statisticians of American religious bodies tracked 187 denominations. Didn't know there were that many. Mm. Between 1990 and 2000, in that time, 37 disappeared and 54 new ones appeared on the scene. Um, so the number is right. All these like strip mall type church things, yeah. right? Popping up. We've all got their slightly different version of Christianity or mm-hmm. whatever religion. Um, well, I guess like the people who handled the poisonous snakes were among the 37 who disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but adherents and pastors, too, were constantly on the move. One study found that half the pastors of so-called mega churches, we've all okay. seen those, you know, they're like those big Walmart-sized things. Uh, half of the pastors of those so mega churches have moved from another denomination. Uh, according to the uh, C- uh, City, of Univers- City University of New York study, which is the ARIS survey, 16% of American adults, 33 million people, say they have switched denominations. You know, okay. So it's all, you know, you would think that if this was all one big truth handed down from on high, you know, that all that kind of thing wouldn't be necessary. But yeah, yeah. again, you know, people create God in their image. They, they find a religion that suits kind yeah. of how they want to live their lives anyway. Yeah. And, and then, of course, they claim that they're the one chosen <laughs> sect yeah. of, you know, uh, yeah. of, of God. So, um, but a fascinating article. Um, because it does talk about how, you know, okay, well, I'll just read it. To Europeans, religion is the strangest and most disturbing feature. Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, you know, they worry that fundamentalists are hijacking the country. That's a sound worry. Yeah. Um, and given how, how powerful America is in, in world politics and in uh-huh. you know, world power in general, uh-huh. that's kind of scary. Yeah. If this were, you know, Irish who were, you know, devoutly Catholic or and Lichtenstein. stuff like that. It's yeah. like, eh, concerning, <laughs> not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> but we have yes. nuclear bombs. <laughs> That's right, George Bush, and we got nuclear bombs. Scary. Thank goodness we don't have any nuclear bombs, but we got plenty of <laughs> nuclear bombs. Uh, Europeans find it extraordinary that three times as many Americans believe in the virgin birth as in evolution. They fear that America will go on a crusade, a term briefly used by Mr. Bush himself, in the Muslim world or cut aid to poor countries less to be used for birth control. And yeah. you do see a lot of these fundamentalist attitudes yes. um, affecting how the Bush administration is approaching science. Yeah. Um, you know, they... Uh, <laughs> The, whole, the most infamous thing that Bush did was this weird little compromise that he thought he was doing with stem cell research. Yes, yeah. And uh, where he misrepresented the number of like viable stem cell lines that were available to research. He said there were something like 64. Actually, there are, I think, fewer than 10. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, uh, George W. Bush has appointed, uh, you know, like, he, he appointed a man who uh, Refuses to prescribe birth control to unmarried women. Yes, for as being in, in charge of, uh, I yeah. think, so, in, in some position having to do with women's with health. Women's find, health, yeah. You know, he, I have to find he, the exact position. The he exact had written guy. a book that said that if you know what they're suffering from, you know, PMS or stuff like that, that here are certain Bible passages that they should read to overcome this. Yeah, don't, prayers, don't, prayers to say. Don't give them medicine. Give them yeah. prayers for yeah. their pain. Yeah. So the guy's basically so. a witch doctor. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, yeah. So these things we are seeing, especially in you know in the current administration, we're seeing these kinds of fundamentalist religious attitudes um, uh, affecting public policy, and that is a concern. Yes. You know because it's you know it, that goes beyond. Okay. Well, look, you're free to believe what you want to believe. Exactly. As long as you don't let those superstitions you know negatively affect the people around you or me. Yeah. And and it, clearly the line is being crossed when you're like denying people health care. Yes. And um, you know denying people uh, you know the, the education that they need. To yeah. avoid, you know, problems that could very easily be avoided. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, based upon some ideology that you're free to have. Yeah, yeah. You know, but um, yeah, but imposing these things. So, uh, but just uh, it was a really interesting article. You know, I talked about it. Um, like I said on the uh, radio show, we actually discussed um, that whole topic in detail. The three of us who were there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the show last week was fairly interesting. The radio show. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know Paul was on there, and you mm-hmm. and Russell and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just turned out to have some really good discussion on there. Yeah. So, so four seven seven two two eight eight. You know, don't uh, don't be bashful. Give us a call. Um, we know that a lot of folks are probably still uh, out and about, uh, you know, finishing up the holiday weekend, or maybe you're shopping, or maybe you're just enjoying a pretty Sunday. It's been a nice day today. Yeah. 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 But if you got questions and comments, call us up four seven seven two two eight eight is that number to call. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So what else? Uh, not too much going on right now. Um, actually, was out last night. Um, mm-hmm. with the telescope. 
Ah. I uh, went out to a place way out in the country um, to look at some of that, and uh, it, was, it was a nice night. It was very clear to get out of the city and get some dark skies. Um, what's that? What's what they got out there? Were the Leonids this week? Or did they already happen? Uh, you got, uh, that that was a couple weeks back, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say the nineteenth or something like that. I'm not, oh, okay. I'm not exactly sure. So not okay. Um, not too long ago. But yeah, not too long ago. But but yeah, that was a little while ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was nice to just get out there and just pull a telescope out, see some of the stuff, and again mm-hmm. get nice dark skies. Yeah. About a half an hour outside of town. Uh, so. So yeah, it's always nice to just take a step, take a step back and and look at the sky. <laughs> look at so. yeah. Speaking of which, I think we could probably segue into the one uh, the caller uh, who uh, the viewer who wrote us last week about the anthropic principle. Okay. Since we're having a little time, waiting for some folks to call us up. 477-2288. Well, one of our emails that we got last week, and I don't have a printout with me, but uh, you know, the uh, the caller basically uh, mentioned the uh, what is known as the anthropic principle. There's there's two versions of it, and he was basically charting out the weak anthropic principle, okay. which okay. is this whole idea that the universe is here, and we're able to observe the universe. And so it sort of makes sense that uh, you know we must have been designed to be to be here to be able to observe this universe. Okay. Otherwise, if we were not around to observe this universe, then why even have a universe? Yeah, what would be the point? Yes. <laughs> and so clearly there'd be no point in making this big old universe if there weren't some people around to say, wow, it's a big old universe. Or something to that effect, right? Okay. <laughs> now, uh, of course, you know, this is... It's it's almost Zen, right? In yeah. kind of the way it it, it 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 looks at the whole issue of creation and why are we here? Because you know it it seems to be really similar to the whole thing of, you know, if, if tree falls in a forest and there's no one around to hear the noise, yeah. then is there really a noise type of thing? And yeah. that's kind of the same sort of thinking that informs the anthropic principle. But you know what? The real answer to the whole thing is that yeah, that's it's fun to kind of speculate about that yeah, kind to, of stuff. Yeah, to play with your mind essentially. Yeah. But <laughs> but really, you know, if, here's the thing: if we were, um. You know these these tube worms, right? Living on the bottom of the ocean, yeah. thirty thousand feet down by a hydrothermal yeah. vent, and we were just floating there, going, "Wow, you know, <laughs> this I, I seem to be so perfectly suited to my environment. This yeah. all must have been made for me. Yeah. Aren't I lucky? And look, I can observe all this darkness around. Well, even if yeah. I'm a worm, but still, you know. Yeah. And you know, it sort of wherever, whatever kind of life form you had, if it were capable, if it were self-aware, and if it, if it were on some distant world breathing methane, and were able to look at the world around it, and, you know, and say, there's this big, massive universe out there, and here I am down here, well, uh, aren't, you know, aren't I lucky? Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. So it's sort of, you know, it would seem to that life form that their environment and their universe had been put together for them, yeah. in a sense. And it's, it's also a very narrow view of the world. Because, again, I mean, looking at our planet, which is relatively small as planets go, mm-hmm. as we've seen, it's on. It's circling this one star, which is really not all that special. Um, why, if this universe were created specifically, you know, so that we could be here and say, "Ooh, wow, isn't it all neat?" Uh, what's up with so many other stars? The vastness of the universe. I mean, there's so much out there. It's so mm-hmm. big. It, well, it's, it's, be... it's an awfully inefficient way to go about things. <laughs> well, <laughs> if nothing else, you know, it could be there that, that that there are other species out there looking up, and and eventually one day we're all going to kind of get together and and and, and have a big, big shindig. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> In fact, who was it who came up with the uh, the bean dip problem? Oh yes, yeah. there was. A, there's something to do. This I actually doesn't have that, to do with yeah. that, but it, it has to do with um, transhumanist <laughs> thought. It was the uh, some worked out that if. Uh, if you cloned enough people yeah. to spread them out to absolutely every single star in the Milky Way galaxy, yeah. and they investigated all the stars, every single last one of them, and then all those people met at the other end of the Milky Way galaxy, yeah. and some somebody who had apparently quite a great deal of time on his hands <laughs> worked out like how much bean dip they would need for the, yeah, big, for party the big party that they were going to hold uh, to celebrate doing yeah. what they had done. <laughs> And he worked out that the mass of the bean dip would be so much that it would form a black hole yeah, that, would, that would, would swallow the entire it, galaxy. It would implode <laughs> and, and party over real quick. Uh, so uh, I don't know, but you know the the, the point is, you know the, the anthropic principle just basically does everything backwards, right? I mean, you know, we adapted to fit our environment. Exactly. You know, it just wasn't that our environment was here for us and what yeah. have you. And of course, the the strong anthropic principle is even worse, right? Because that's um. That specifically, I mean, you'll hear, I've heard a lot of Christians argue, 
along the lines of, all right, you know, look at how far away this Earth is from the sun. If it were a thousand miles closer, a thousand miles further away, exactly. You know, we wouldn't be able to breathe or live. It'd be too hot, too cold, what have you. Yeah. Uh, there's just enough oxygen here, etc., etc., etc. Doesn't this prove that there must have been some divine guidance or designing hand involved? Yeah. And it's no, quite the opposite. In fact, that is an argument for, you know, just natural processes doing what they do. Because, you know, if you're looking at you know, the creator that at least, you know, Christians propose is yeah. responsible, which is an all powerful deity, omnipotent, no no limits to his abilities, then it wouldn't matter how near or far away from the exactly. earth we are. He'd just make the sun out a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. We, we wouldn't have to do anything. I mean he'd yeah. create us to live in vacuum if you wanted to. He yeah. could create us to live on the surface of the yeah. sun. It wouldn't matter. I mean we could you know he could have created us for any sort of environment. You know, he could have created us to adapt to to other environments at the snap of a finger. You know, yeah. we could uh Go from living in the environment we live in now to flying out in space and not needing spacesuits, yeah. you know, to being able to walk around on the moon yeah. with no problem. Given all the different environments yeah. that are present in the universe, we can only survive in a very tiny slice of mm -hmm. them. It has to be just the right temperature, just the right humidity, just the right amount of light. Mm -hmm. You send us under the ocean, we die. You send us into space, we die. Mm -hmm. so. so, yeah, and an all-powerful God would not have those limitations. Yeah. You know, would not be restricted by those limitations. You exactly. know, it would not matter. You know, uh, you know how how near or how far, or how hot or how cold, or any of that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, omnipotent. <laughs> it means you <laughs> Can know do anything. Yeah. So anyway, okay, calls are coming back, and we've got Gene online. Juan, how you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. Um, excuse my uh, voice today. I'm having a little allergy situation. No, it's okay. Um, I want to ask you to, to remind me to come back to what you were just talking about and uh, Dr. Peter Ward's rare earth theory. But I have a question that I hope will raise the level of discourse a little bit. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh -huh. If there were a God, uh -huh. but no religions, would there still be atheists? Well, yeah, because um, well, if there were like if there were a god and it were provably true in the way that like gravity and other scientific principles are provable. I mean, if if I were if 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 there were a god and and its existence were provable in the same way that we all know for a fact that uh, you know George Bush exists. Are you well? Let's, I mean, let's yeah, not go there. But uh, well, what do you see, <laughs> well? What do you mean? I mean, yeah. you could have a god. You could have a god who uh, reveals his you know, no. Yeah, but what so? So, you you well, can have a God who reveals his existence, or you, and you can have a God who doesn't reveal his existence. Okay. If the God doesn't reveal his existence, chooses not to reveal his existence even though he could, then there are probably going to be people who are skeptical about his existence and choose not to believe it without evidence. Okay. If, God, if God were to choose to reveal his existence, then, you know, atheism becomes moot. Oh, okay, okay there's a God. Fine, let's move on. Okay, so. and, that, and that's sort of my point, because yeah. if, if you're not, if you're only talking about God, who's who's never done anything to you, uh, and not actively True. opposing religions, specifically Christianity, which has done everything to everybody, then, um, you know, I, 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 I don't... What kind of evidence would you accept? I mean, you talk about yeah. as if it were material evidence. Well, you know, yeah. God is not material, so, okay. yeah. you know, in the first place... You know, it's kind of like Mr. Spock said, you know, our our machines only register what they're designed to register, Captain. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it there we've had this question a couple times before and really don't have any good evidence for it, or any good uh answers to that. Um again, science can uh, would... can prove a lot of things in the world. Um it can show that things exist, things don't exist, this is how things work. Um, as for a god, um, it, it really depends on the definition of that god. What you know, what the definition of it was would kind of def would kind of define how it could be defined and proved. Um, any kind of claim out there, you can make uh, you can get deductions for that. You can get an idea. Well, if this is how God operates, then you should see this kind of thing going on. Then you can look for that thing, and if it's not there, well, that God doesn't exist, or at least doesn't work in that way. Um, it, it depends on the definition of God. In general, just for the you know basic question of what kind of proof do you need for God, no answer. I'm not sure. 
Well, um, yeah, I would approach the question a, a little differently than that. Um, well, first off, if yeah, I mean, for example, if we are, dis- you know, if Mr. Spock and the, the Star Trek uh, whole thing of our machines are only it's it's life, Jim, but not as we know it, yeah. and what have you, and. <laughs> Uh, if we are only designed to experience things a certain way, okay, well then, you know, that doesn't seem to me to be something that we can really help. And so um, I don't really think that uh, it's it's inappropriate as an atheist for me to expect some sort of, you know, empirical evidence for a deity's existence uh, for uh, for a few reasons. First off, uh, just about every religion in the world, but let's we'll focus on Christianity just because that's the main player, at least in our society. Every religion in the world, uh, whether their god is defined in these vague and you know uh, ineffable spiritual terms or not, you know, it's like, well, you can't have you know this sort of concrete uh, evidence of this yeah. being because he's not material. He's just, but even if even if they want to define their god in those kinds of ways, so that he somehow gets to be exempt from empiricism and observation, still the belief system. If you if you read the Bible and if you study the Christian faith and if you talk to Christians about what they believe. They are talking about a God that whatever his physical or non or non physical or material or non material nature might be, he is directly interacting with people and with the physical world. You know, he uh, makes judgments about the lives of people on the earth. Okay. He, uh, you know, according to the Bible, he would directly intervene in certain actions. You know, he would send plagues of locusts and this and that. You know, they're all, you know, Christians claim to believe in miracles, which is, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's God doing something that's all in violation of natural law because he wants this thing to happen, and the easiest way to do it is through magic, right? So even if Christians or believers or theists want to shield the God that they believe in from any sort of empirical observation by saying he can't be observed this way, then you still have to say, all right, but what about all these things that you say your God does? Okay, if you if if you say that your God can do this, that, or the other thing, and I don't see any evidence of this, that, or the other thing taking place, again, what reason do I have? What evidence do I have to believe in your God? You know, and you know, finally, as as per the whole notion of you know, what's the difference between a God that or or any sort of entity, any sort of being, that you know cannot be detected by, you know, the kinds of the means that human beings use to detect and understand and learn about the world around them. What's the difference between that kind of God and no God at all? Yeah. A God that you can't detect and no God. I don't see that there's any. If we can detect so, everything that has anything to do with anything, yeah. again, if you have the Starship Enterprise and you can detect all these different things and God is outside of that, what's the point of it? Yeah. Okay, so I mean, what, what, what relevance does God to have to the Starship point. Enterprise let's, at that let's point? Go, let's go back to the original point. The original point is, uh, you know, why beat up on God? God's not doing any, doing any harm, not doing you any harm. Why oh, even talk he's, about God? He's doing vast... I can understand, I can understand okay. yeah. that okay. you would be against yeah. religions. I can understand that you would be against the Christian religion. Mm-hmm. I can understand that you would call Christianity to task. Okay, Here, or, here's, here's, here's or my in offer the, then. In the world, because they insist on historiography. Okay, yeah. then here, here is my uh, suggestion to God then. Uh, if if uh, you know God doesn't like atheists, uh, you know going out and, and and God doesn't have any opinion about atheist or about you. Well, that's why that's why you th- have an opinion about God. Well, okay. Well, you know I whatever mean, it is that God does, I don't know about. Okay, yeah. if there even if even if there is one, if you claim to have knowledge of one, <laughs> then I'll, I'll be happy to look at your evidence. But okay, if if um, our criticisms of religion and the things that people do in the name of God that are bad. Uh, are are deserved. If our, if our if the things that uh, that we criticize uh, fundamentalists for, and fanatics for, and suicide bombers for, and you know, and and whoever does a bad thing in the name of their faith and in the name of some god, uh, and and that's worth criticizing. That's deserving of criticism. Then I think. My opinion of God, not only my belief that he might even exist, but my opinion of God would probably improve dramatically if God were to come down and say, all right, all you stupid religious people doing bad, horrible things and crashing planes into buildings and whatever all you're doing in my name, stop this stuff right now, you know, or I'll fricassee all of you or do whatever it is that gods do to express their displeasure. Yeah, if see, God has the opportunity to do that, and if I can observe that, and then I'll say, all right, God, I'll stop. You know, saying you don't exist, and I will stop. Uh, you know, making disparaging remarks about you. Yeah, but you know? 
but if you get if if I get a reason to do these things. Okay, 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 okay. You're you you you're still you're still uh, you know back doing okay. the backstroke. Okay. Uh, well, then, no. Then, I mean, then, I'm then, talking uh, to you what, about what I'm trying. What I'm trying to get you to do uh -huh. is to is to be a little more active uh, against religions and forget about God. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould said that science and religion were non-overlapping magisteria. Did yeah. you ever hear that? Mm -hmm. They yeah. don't. Yeah. They don't even intersect with each other. Okay. They have yeah. such different realms of interest. So mm -hmm. yeah. the the thing I'm saying is, it's the religions that do the harm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you need to be more. Yeah. You okay. know, throw away your 501c3 and. Get into the political realm. Okay. Well, you know, uh, let's go ahead and useful. Yeah. Well. Okay. Well, let's answer this then. Uh, there are lots of religions out there. There are, as you as you said, there was an, a survey of like well over a hundred different sects of Christianity alone. Now we could take our time and say, look at all the bad things that we'll just lump all Christianity together. Look at the bad things that Christianity has done. That doesn't deserve to be around. Look at all the bad things that Islam has done. That shouldn't be around. Look at all the wackiness in Buddhism. That shouldn't be around. Or we can go to the heart of everything and say, look at this whole concept of God, which there is absolutely no evidence of. There is no way to prove it. There are logical inconsistencies everywhere consider concerning God. So we can say that chances are God doesn't exist. Therefore, Christianity, Islam, and all the other religions also have it wrong. And so they should go away. We can attack all the tiny little gnats, or we can just go for the dragon. <laughs> so that's an interesting way to look at it. And yeah, like, it, it, uh, it is an interesting way to look at yeah. it. But when you start out your 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 discussion, say you know, talking about uh, wackiness, you know, to me that's not taking the, the thing seriously. Yeah. And, because uh, what, what, and what that's, is, and that's what one of mean? the things that I notice on this program. I mean, you. You're like adolescent boys. It's laughing and giggling about stuff that's So what really should we important. be? Should we be ranting and raving and and and, and, yeah. and you know and satisfying really all your satisfying all the nasty stereotypes? People... Of... Yeah. Wait uh, a minute, Colin. Another... Hang on, Ashley. Not okay. well, Wait a minute. Do you, do you think that that way, that's what we should be doing instead? Being negative and being out there. Uh, I mean, when when religious people do something silly, it's laughable. You know. I mean, when silly things are out there existing. You know, when, when uh, that's you know, there are laughable aspects of religion, and we find it amusing. We're not going to apologize for laughing at those things. But, but the consequences are not amusing. Yeah. Well, but but the alternative is uh, there. The an another another what? another part of this show is education, and we kind of, we're on here and we're having a good time. We take it kind of light because we want to show people who haven't seen. Most people's idea of an atheist come from, comes from their preachers who say that atheists all hate everybody. Mm -hmm. They're nasty, mean people who just, you know, want to spit at everybody. <laughs> Not really true. And so we can educate them just by saying, you know, look, we're a couple normal guys on TV. We're atheists. We don't believe in God. But we're not just sitting around bitching about everything 24-7. Yeah. You know, we're just like everybody else. Yeah, I mean, that's not the that's, atheist that's experience. That's another part of this show. Yeah, I mean, that's what the, so. the title of the name of the show is, Atheist Experience. And, exactly. And, and part of it is to, you know, certainly get across the idea that the atheist experience is not all bitterness and anger and... Uh, exactly. Yeah, but and, what, uh, how are you fine. moving it forward that way? Well... I mean, it's not, it's not apparent to yeah. me. We're, we're, not, we're not here to promote atheism. Well, hang exactly. on. Well, in a, in a, we're not we're not here to do the same thing that to like convert. religious television does, yeah. right? Which is to sort of indoctrinate or you know people into a specific view. But the idea is that um, you know the the whole notion is that there is, there are no you know, no one is out there sort of representing the other voice on the media, and and we're here to represent that voice in a positive way and in a way. And other atheists look at our show and they're like, you know, that it's it's okay to be atheist. You know, in our culture, um, most of the people who are members of our organization joined the organization because they discovered the organization through the TV show. You know, and uh, and then when people join the group, they find out that it's basically a social group. It's an opportunity for atheists to get together and meet. And for those people who do want to be activists in the political circle, there is that going on. You know, we have done uh, a lot of things that have to do with activism. In terms of, we had some people uh, participate in the the march on Washington uh, a year about a year ago. Yeah. Um, we've we've had press conferences. Um, we had uh, 
I think a year ago, January, uh, about almost two years ago now, January o two, we had the uh, separation of church and state. Okay. No, we had we got uh, the declaration of, uh, you know, the the uh, the anniversary of Thomas Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptists. Yeah. And our organization is out there more to do positive things, uh, you know, to show that a, a to, you know again to reinforce the notion of positive atheism than it is to always be out there protesting stuff and being angry and, and things like that. But, you know, uh, it's. Uh, uh, so that's what we do. You know, we're not here to uh, reinforce other people's stereotypes about us. So, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, we don't. But, you know, what, whatever, you, whatever you think. Yeah. Uh, I just feel like. Well, we don't have an ideology. We don't have an ideology that we are telling everyone this is what you should think about all yeah, this no, kind of I understand stuff. That. We're just presenting our opinions of religion, and uh, and and we don't take ourselves all that seriously. You know, which yeah. I think is a good thing for people not to take themselves too seriously. No, no, I think I think that's fine. Uh, yeah. You know, whatever you, what whatever works for you. Mm-hmm. My, uh, you know, I I will admit to you that I am a deist and mm-hmm. that I am probably the most fanatical anti-Christian that you'll ever come across. <laughs> yeah. And I I don't believe in uh, in a ex annihilating creator God. Right. I mean. Uh, you know, I I prefer Alan Watts's formula when he said, "You yourself are the eternal energy that appears as this universe." Mm-hmm. And when you know, I look at you two guys sitting there. Okay, that's God energy, to, you know, talking to me. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, but I really also like to get uh, some some folks. Uh, on my side, against these, you know, uh, the, you, you were talking earlier about how how the government was taken over by the the right wing Christians. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's, you know, it may be time to draw the sword. Yeah. Well, we and, don't, and we do do a lot of that. We do again violence, but uh, but yeah, to, uh, we. No, we, no, we constantly hear. We frequently I, get on the program. I was just, you know, yeah. using a biblical no, I understand. expression to. You know, well, you always got to be clear, though, when some people are listening and they'll yeah. interpret what you say a certain way. But I agree with you in that we, uh, at least once a week, or at least a couple times a month on the show, we'll get a call from a Christian who will say, I'm a Christian, but... And then he'll go on to say how, you know, please don't... I'm not like Falwell. I'm not like Pat Robertson. I'm not one of these intolerant right-wingers. Please don't lump us all, da 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 And I say, well, we don't lump you all together, but, you know, you are the guys who need to be out there standing against what the far-right-wing fundamentalists are doing, you know, in, you know uh, in, in terms of the intolerance that they're expressing, you know, the sorts of laws that they're trying to pass, uh, the, the way in which they're essentially trying to legislate their religion, uh, you know, get some, form of, some sort of formal government endorsement of their faith over all other faiths. Mainstream Christians, the people who don't consider themselves the far right, are the ones who need to be out there, you know, uh, uh, speaking against these people. You know, they, they need to grow a backbone and get out there and stand up to Ashcroft and Falwell and all the rest of them, and Judge Roy Moore and what have you, and not just be mute and go, oh well, and you know, there's nothing we can do. You know, because you're right, they're not going to listen to us. They're not going to listen to, you know, deists, and and uh, you know, they they do kind of need to uh, to take that responsibility. But we got to move on to our next caller. But we we do okay. appreciate your. Let calls. me just say one one more thing. Go ahead. Look at a book called Rare Earth uh-huh. by mm-hmm. Dr. Peter D. Ward. Okay. And and Don Brownlee. Okay. Where he expresses a theory that while life is very common in the universe, higher forms of life are not. Yeah, I have heard of that book. It's in a, it's, but I, I haven't read it, but I have heard yeah, of it, so it, be worth it's, reading. It's very eye-opening. Yeah, I'll try and read it if I get a chance. It's been, you know, it's one of those I've been putting off. Thank so. you for putting up with me so long. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate your, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to uh, clear the air on some stuff. Yeah. Thank Take you. care. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Bill is on the line. We had a phone call. We had a girl waiting by the name of Crystal, and I would love for you to call back. Okay? So, by all means. Bill, hi. You're on the air. Hi, guys. How are you doing? We're okay. Hey. What's up? Oh, I just want to run through uh, some things real quick. Mm-hmm. First, on, on TV recently, or not too long ago, I don't know if you all ever caught the series by Penn and Teller called BS. Oh, I don't get Showtime. Yeah. Neither yeah. do I, but someone taped it for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've and heard they of it. really, really shoot down some of the wackiest ideas. They're not 
Mm-hmm. So heavy on religion necessarily, but mm-hmm. on uh, seances and bottled water and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and yeah. whack on environmentalists and so on. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping they'll put Another it out on one. DVD or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Another one um, was just this last Wednesday night. There was a rerun of a public policy debate on C-SPAN, and your boy Barry Lynn was on, and he came off as a genius. He really, really did well, and I had never seen him in such an extended format, yeah. other than little five-minute bites on uh, yeah. one-minute bite yeah. on the news. And he really, really came across great. He's yeah, he's a, he's a good guy, and and it should be pointed out, he is a Christian who is out there standing against the far religious right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He he's a reverend. He's a reverend. He's a minister. He's not an atheist, but he heads up an organization called Americans United for Separation of Church mm-hmm. and State. Mm-hmm. And the fundamentalists hate his guts. I mean, <laughs> yeah. they treat him as essentially a traitor to the faith. And um, he was great on the yeah. issue, of course. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Church and state. Yeah. The other one was uh, it was either last week or two weeks ago, probably on mm-hmm. South Park about the Mormons. <laughs> yes, I saw that. Oh. Excellent. Oh. <laughs> is that a rerun or a new one? Huh? I was, was think it, it was actually one? a rerun. It seemed a little bit. And I'll tell you, my kids. Uh-huh. Um, are already amazed by just regular old evangelicals and uh-huh. um, and fundamentalists, and they're saying, "Is this real?" I said, "Oh yeah." <laughs> and there's like millions of them, mm. less than a hundred years or 150 years. Yeah. Right. So it shows how yeah, the guy I'm talking about the mime or meme. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know. Yeah. I mean, look at the success of Mormonism. Yeah. To realize how wacky. These religions are. Yeah. 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 Right? And then, now turning a little bit meaner, I guess. Well, maybe not. <laughs> um, I've come to the conclusion that the fundamentalist evangelicals can be defined by three words to some lesser or greater degree of the following. They are either ignorant, which of course they are if they believe this stuff, stupid, or evil. And it's some mixture or degree of those three. Oh. Um, mm. And that's uh, what I can say. I mean, yeah, I, I, don't I, want, I, I don't want to get into specifics. I don't want to bash yeah. and whatever. But if you look at it, I'm, I like to think I'm a rationalist and a skeptic. Yeah. And you look at things rationally and with a skeptical eye, for instance, James mm-hmm. Randi, I would call one of my heroes. Yeah. Who appears, by the way, on several of those Penn and Teller. Oh, I bet that's fine. Yeah. Mm. And, um, and then just some of the hypocrisy, which I know you can write volumes and volumes on it, but some of it I like is uh, with the rules about the sab. Oh, here's the one, and then I'll let you guys go and wait for your comments on the, on the air. Okay. Um, family values, okay? Mm-hmm. If they're so high on family values, the conservative... Christians, the fundamentals, whatever mm-hmm. group I think we know what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Why are they also so gung ho on the military and so gung ho on being in Iraq? Which, by the way, I support, but that doesn't mean I can't look at it rationally. Um, what is worse for a family, little kids, than to have the father separated from them? Yeah. Uh, but then the argument there, okay. or just a traditional military, even when we're at peace, to be moving from here to there to there to there. I mean, any, any. Uh, yeah, but you're serving God and country, right? I, I mean, it's I, I all understand. reinforcing that. I'm just that. saying the hypocrisy and and the conflict in in their ideas, mm-hmm. and that's just one small mm-hmm. example. Yeah. Uh, family values. We got to stand for family values. But what's worse for family values than being a military man who has to constantly move his family or be away from his family for months on end? Oh. And I'm not saying that I, that I don't appreciate the military people uh-huh. because I do. I do think it's a necessary uh, evil and, and part of our survival and guaranteeing our freedom, etc. But. It, it does show up the hypocrisy in the thinking of these people. Okay. It's just illogical, irrational. And you guys do a great job. I've been watching on and off for a couple of years. Okay, well, okay. we appreciate the comments, Bill. Yeah. And I'll listen to what you have to any replies you have. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks, Oh, I appreciate Okay, bye. I'll start. First response. Um, you had 
said a little bit earlier that the general gist seemed to be that religious people are either ignorant, stupid, or evil. Um, I, I'd really hesitate to labeling it like that. Well, simply because a lot of people don't think about religion as deeply as you and I and you know some of the people in the group do, and some very religious people do. Um, most people are, yeah, I think there's a God out there, but, you know, I don't go to religion, I don't go to church all that often, I don't study all the theological arguments, stuff like that. And so, they're just, they're not active in it. And so, they're wrong. But I wouldn't call them ignorant or stupid if you don't study it. Again, if it's some, if it's, you know, some, somebody living out in the bushes, and, you know, they're, from all their assumptions, the world is flat because of everything that they've seen. Are they ignorant, stupid, or evil? I'd have a hard time nailing it down well, in such harsh terms. Yeah. Well, of, of those three terms, right, ignorant is the, less, the least inflammatory simply because exactly. it implies that you just don't know any better, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, again, a little Stone Age tribesman living in the Amazon, you know, is, is, is ignorant, yeah. Of, you know, quantum physics. Yeah. And, but, again, you know, that and my, main, my main concern is yeah. just that these these terms yeah. have a lot of weight to them. Yeah. If you call someone ignorant, that that's almost a personal attack on them rather than just saying, well, I'm ignorant on a lot of things. Yeah. And I'm again, ignorant on tax laws. Yeah. You know, I mean, sure. I mean, there's a great many things that I'm ignorant about. Uh, but it's it what, ha what it has to do with is religion becomes a problem only when it causes you either to lose the ability to make good decisions, okay, I, I, and it, or it causes you to lose the ability to observe the world around you accurately, okay, or uh, when it just or it actively makes you make bad decisions that you then rationalize, yeah. okay. So just because a person believes in God, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's that is just that's just a byproduct of their upbringing. Yeah. Now, that certainly does have, there's a lot about that that you can criticize. Richard Dawkins recently gave a speech where he said that this is one of, you know, the very, very negative influences about religion in culture, right? And he pointed to examples of, like, little Catholic schoolgirls in Northern Ireland being spit on yeah. by, you know, adult Protestants simply because their parents, you know, labeled them Catholic. They were just raised in that environment, so it's because of who they are. It's just like the way the Jews have always been persecuted, yeah. or, or gypsies, or people, just because they are in this group, and other groups don't like you. So just because of that, they treat you badly. Yeah. Now that is, and now that is a case I think of religion going bad because it, it is causing people to not have an accurate assessment of the world around them, and it is, you know, in other words, essentially we're all the same. We're all Homo sapiens. Yeah. You know, whatever the creed, yeah. whatever the upbringing. So there's no real reason to treat one group less well than any other group. Um, and it's causing these people to make, to to out to overtly make bad decisions. You know, to inflict upon, you know, to inflict violence upon others simply because they disagree with your creed. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So um, now, not every religious person would do this, though. Okay. Of so I mean, not every Protestant is out there looking for a Catholic schoolgirl to spit on. You yeah. know, not and not every Catholic <laughs> is out there looking to throw a brick at a Protestant. Yeah. You know, you know, not every Muslim is out there looking for a Jew to blow up. You yeah. know, and well, along with himself. You know. But um, it seems that religion, more than anything else in human civilization, is the key thing. It is the thing that can trigger that kind of activity. It can push you over the edge. Yeah. You know, when you have an irrational belief system in the first place, you know, then the sky's the limit. And yeah, I mean, you can, you can justify uh, many, many different, you know, actions that don't make sense. Now, although I, um, I'm less... I have less of a harsh, uh, you know, view on like, you know, thinking that uh, Christians are hypocritical because they support the military and family values at the same time. Because the argument there, and I think you could you could say that it's sound to a certain degree, is that well, you know, military is a necessary thing to protect these families that we cherish. Yeah. You know, from people who would drop planes on us and stuff. Yeah. So, now the fact that one of the practical byproducts of military life sometimes means that families are broken up or what have you. Well, you know, I mean, nothing's ever perfect. Yeah. Um, but again, then you know, you you would think that if the Christians were right, and there is this benevolent, uh, you know, omnibenevolent, loving deity out there, you know, protecting all of us, then you know, all, there should be no reason for all of this strife. You yeah. know, if if there is this one truth, God you know, God could prevent God, all of this by coming down yeah. and saying, "Look, God Christianity's be, right. Or Give not just it up, Christian, everybody else. Or just you know, 
I'm here and I'll, everybody yeah. quit messing with everybody. Exactly. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. but you know. speaking of shows, to go back to one, right. of the, one of the minor points you made. We're still waiting um, for Crystal to call back, by the way. I hope you haven't like <laughs> chickened out or anything. We're really, um, I'd very much like to hear from you. But yeah, I've, I've heard some really good things about the Penn and Teller show. Yeah. I haven't actually seen an episode, but I've heard I've some heard episodes are better than others. But. Um, but another show that's out there that's a little bit off topic, but uh-huh. Mythbusters on Discovery. That is an excellent show. You've mentioned that like a zillion times. Yeah, it's an show. excellent show. It just talks about uh, all the common myths and misconceptions. Uh-huh. Um, things like uh, the story that some guy strapped a Jado, one of those jet assisted takeoff things, to the back of his Chevy. <laughs> And blew it into the side of a mountain. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, you know, they, they actually take, they find the old car in the story that one of these, they take a Jado, they strap it to the top, and they remote control it. That never happened. Oh. You know, I mean, it's so much, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a great show. They talk about all these different things uh-huh. um, and just go over myths. And, and it's, it's surprising the number of them that they find are actually true. They always say that, you know, you shouldn't eat poppy seeds or anything like that before taking a drug test because, you know, dude, heroin comes from poppies. And oh, yeah, and you get a technically you get a it's true. Positive, right. They they did test positive for drugs. Eat. Now, granted, you have to eat like you know a whole pack of you know <laughs> pop. You have to eat yeah. a fair bit of these things, you know, get uh-huh. sick on them practically. But uh-huh. it does happen. So, oh, well. um, but yeah, it's a very interesting show. It's a lot uh, of fun. Nine minutes left in the program, people. If you have, if you have a call, if you want to, if you have something to say to us, uh, get that call in really quickly, and we'll take you on the uh, we'll get you on the air. Uh, what is? Um, I was going to read something while uh, Bill was on the air. Again, getting back to, um, yeah, right here it says, but the really distinctive feature of American religion is the area in the middle, right, between fundamentalism and the atheists. And the atheists. Most Americans do not become members of a church to sign up for a crusade or to sit in judgment on miserable sinners. Exactly. For them, church going is a matter of personal belief, not conservative activism. Their religion is mild. In 1965, according to Gallup poll, half of respondents said, that the most important purpose of their church was to teach people to live better lives. Since then, that share has grown to almost three quarters. This is the biggest change in America's religious life in the past 40 years. Um, so, although you do see the fundamentalists as having the most power simply because they're well-financed and they're being and fundamental. vocal. Yeah, because yeah. that's what it is to be a fundamentalist. Um, they don't represent the majority in the mainstream, uh, but they can certainly seem that way when they're the guys on TV. Yeah. But I do think that the majority in the mainstream is at fault because they're not coming back and, um, you know, standing up to you yeah. know, all these people that they tell us are embarrassing them. Yeah. And it's like, don't tell us, tell them. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but again, this is yeah. really, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, when you have guys like, uh, here we go, evangelicals have become more willing to engage in politics. White evangelical presidents, here we go, represent almost a third of registered voters now. Up from slightly below a quarter in 1987, their leaders have tried to unite the various evangelical churches as a political force, establishing the moral majority in 1979 and the Christian Coalition in 1989. And their comments speak for themselves. Franklin Graham, Billy's son, called Islam a wicked religion. The former president of the Southern Baptist Convention called the Prophet Muhammad a demon-possessed pedophile. <laughs> You're just asking for trouble. I know. Sort of, yeah. you know. Again, it's see that... <laughs> But, you know, the, the intolerance is built into the belief system, right? Of course. When you have a belief system, one of whose major tenets is that anybody who doesn't adhere to this belief system deserves to be tortured for eternity. Yeah. You know, uh, then, you know, that's going to lead you, you to just not respect others. Yeah, you can, do no, you can do no wrong against these people if they're not worth anything. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. essentially. And we've seen that rationale um, used many, many times before. Unfortunately. Now, there's a viewer feedback address, tv at atheist-community.org, but we still have uh, six minutes to go. So, uh, come on, Crystal, if you're out there, or anyone else, <laughs> 477 the phone number to call us live. Um, and, uh, wow, I guess it's just a holiday weekend. It's kind of slow. It's been yes, a mellow, yeah. mellow day all day, actually. Yeah, it was, it was good. We had, a, like, mm. we had a meeting this morning. Um, everything went well there. It's a um, bagel shop. Yeah, just, yeah. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, it was a good Thanksgiving weekend. So oh. had a party that I went to on Thanksgiving, and then I had a rerun party the next day. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I had one that I was going to go to, but I actually ended up just staying home from it because I didn't really want to get out in the traffic and the okay. craziness and just uh, the people all being out and about what have you. So, anyway. Mm. All right. So, uh, well, what else have we to talk about? Uh, what can we close uh, I know. We're just sort of... Uh, <laughs> 
Left with not the, very often that we don't tick people off more. Well, there's than this. not the uh, what we did, but apparently she's <laughs> uh, you know uh, realized she didn't have an argument and, and ran off. So um, the uh, uh, I had it and now it's gone. <laughs> no, the <laughs> little thought just fluttered away. Uh, something to do with uh, getting back to the percentage of beliefs and what have you. Yes, yes. And you spoke a little bit last week among the num- about the number of scientists who yes. uh, you know were uh, believers versus unbelievers, yeah, and what have you. And we had a caller about uh, you know two weeks ago try to claim that uh, you know the majority of scientists in the world, yeah, you we're know, all were Christian, you know, and yeah. uh, you know put the kibosh on that pretty quickly. But it is interesting how um, you know those numbers do spread out. Uh, you know, among the general population, you, it's 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 almost a direct reversal exactly. of people who understand cosmology, who understand yeah. physics and, and biology and what have you. Um, it's not that atheism just is something that you know that, that goes hand in hand with this sort of thing, with you know a strong scientific education. So much as it is the fact that when you understand natural processes and just how the world works and how you know just things react to one another and how. Yeah. Uh, you have less of a reason to have recourse to uh, supernatural explanations for things. Yes. You know, you don't have any recourse to, uh, you know, need. it used to be that I think, you know, uh, people thought that the reason food went bad when you left it out overnight was because yeah. little imps or fairies or pixies or something would come out and mess with it. Yeah. You know, and pee on it or do whatever yeah. they do, right? Yeah. And now, then we learned about things like vitamins. Yeah. And then we learned about how, you know, these, these all these just naturally these things will break down. Yeah. You know, if you're exposed to the elements or given yeah. time or what have you. Religion. Ah, the religion, magic answer when it had to go away. Yeah. Religion basically relies anymore. on the God of the gaps. The less mm-hmm. we understand, the more you need God. Yeah. As soon as you get high, as soon as you get a good education and you realize that all these things can happen without mm-hmm. God, you start realizing that maybe there isn't a God. Mm-hmm. And religion has done that too. I mean, you've noticed how the religions... Christianity's God, I mean, Christians have kind of made their God smaller. Oh, right? yeah, they, they've, the had more, to. Yeah, they've had to. I mean, it keeps getting pushed back. You know, it used to be that God was everywhere and all-pervasive, and then, you know, it's like, well, where does he live? Well, he lives up in the sky behind the clouds, and then we learned how to fly, and <laughs> yeah. then we didn't see nope, God up there. up there. Oh, well, he's off somewhere else now in some yeah. other distant part of the universe, yeah. and then we got telescopes. Yeah. And, you know... Is now it, he's just a force. So he just keeps getting pushed yeah. back, and yeah. so, again, yeah, just uh, less necessary the more you know. Scott has a question for us. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How are y'all? We are well. I've been watching your show for a while. I really like it. I think this is my first time calling. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am just about the only non-believer in my very large family. Mm -hmm. They're very Church of Christ. and Mm -hmm. My mom thinks I'm going to hell, and that kind of weighs kind of heavily on my mind. I think it's Mm -hmm. irrational, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering if you maybe had any thoughts on maybe how I can talk to her about that to make her feel better about that or any reference sources or anything like that? Well, I would just ask her, do you think that's right? I mean, just because, okay, I have questions, you know, I I have legitimate doubts about the existence of God, okay, do you think that it is right, do you think that it is moral and good for a God to torture someone for all eternity simply because they have questions, they are willing to use their reason you know, and use the, you know, the inquisitive spirit that human beings have just by being intelligent creatures. You know, do you think that that is, is it morally right to sentence somebody to torture for any reason, much less for all eternity and just for not believing something that you're supposed to believe? Yeah. Is that morally right? You know, I don't think, I, I think that the doctrine of hell completely disqualifies Christianity from being having any claim to being a moral belief system. Because this notion of this ultimatum, right, you know, that either you believe this or you deserve an eternity of torture. First off, it's a form of punishment that is all out of proportion to the to the alleged crime, right? Mm-hmm. And you just right. and just uh, you know, if 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 God were this truly loving, omnibenevolent being, okay, he would not set these ultimatums on you. He would not say, anyone who loves you at all, a person, you know, who isn't crazy, would not say to you, all right, love me back or I will torture you. If someone truly loved you, they would love you. And if you decided you didn't love them, they would say, okay, well, go your way then. You yeah. know, they would, if someone really loved you, they wouldn't say, love me back or you'll get hurt. 
That's yeah. just wrong. That's exactly how I feel about it. Yeah. I, I'm trying to form like a really good argument to like yeah. you know help make. Well, why don't you send us a viewer email and maybe we can discuss it in detail? All right. Well, All right. Thanks a lot. Hey, well, thanks for your thanks call for and thanks for watching. And thanks everybody. We just it was a really laid back day on the show today. Lots of fun. Sorry you had to chicken out on us, Crystal, but maybe you'll <laughs> you know grow some sack back next weekend. Theus, we don't hate you. We just think, think you're, you're wrong. wrong. Bye bye. <laughs>